clinical psychologist and author about a recent op-ed that she wrote on this subject. Dr. Chloe, thanks so much for, for coming on with us for Unfiltered. And I wanted to have this conversation with you because you wrote this op-ed and, and it really stood out to me. And the, the title of it is, uh, I believe, Free Speech Not Censorship Benefits Mental Health. What do you mean by that? Well, ac actually, what I mean is exactly what the title says. So there's all of this concern that we need to limit speech because of hate speech and bullying being bad for mental health, whereas actually learning to speak our minds helps our mental health so much more than stifling ourselves. So when we can speak and share and exchange information, that's how we learn and grow and build our self-awareness and actually have true safe spaces where we can actually trust each other and know what e each other are really thinking. Do you understand the pushback on that at all? Well, of course. I mean, there are certain things that are hateful. I'm not saying that we have to lend our ears to everybody, but it's uh, quite another thing to suggest that those people shouldn't be able to speak at all. For example, as a woman, I know that there are many people who think women belong in the kitchen, women are not as intelligent, whatever the case may be. I don't choose to listen to those people, right. but I don't need to silence the right of those people to have their thoughts and opinions either. What made you come out and write this, this piece specifically? Well, as a clinical psychologist, a lot of the people in my profession tend to be, for whatever reason, a lot more on the side that's concerned about bullying and hate speech. And I just thought there needs to be a psychologist out there who's able to speak some common sense as well as some science to the fact that denial, suppression, repression, these things are not good for mental health. And when you start stifling speech, that's actually what you are fostering. What is the science behind it? What, what did you, when you started researching it, what did you find? Well, as a clinical psychologist, part of the psychotherapy process is teaching patients to verbalize their feelings. When we can name our feelings and label our feelings, we actually start to mitigate what's called the amygdala response. The amygdala is the part of the brain that gets very triggered when we feel under pressure. And when we can learn how to slow that part down by labeling our feelings, we're actually able to think in a more clear-headed manner. When we don't speak our feelings and be conscious of them, the science shows that's when we'll act them out. So we might be just aggressive towards people without really understanding why. But if we can talk about our feelings and understand ourselves, we can make much more rational decisions. Have you gotten any pushback from, from your, your colleagues in the mental health community? You know, I actually have, same thing as I, I actually also wrote a piece about that, my concerns about masking children. And of course, I do get some pushback, but I also get a lot of colleagues secretly messaging me, telling me that this is exactly what they thought, but they were just too afraid to say so. And what do you say when, when you do get pushback, though? I invite it as a free speech advocate, of course. I think if somebody disagrees with what I have to say or what anybody else has to say, as psychologists, we're usually all in favor of talking it out. And I'm 100% in favor of that. But there, there has to be a line, though, right? I mean, free speech, but also, obviously, you, you want to be polite to each other, no? Well, we want to be polite to each other and I'm, you know, polite to people, but that doesn't mean that I, I think that that has to become the law of the land, right? I mean, not everybody has to comport themselves with my definition of polite. And if I don't like the way somebody talks, I don't have to listen. Free speech doesn't mean we have to have an unfiltered ear that listens to anything anybody wants to say. But again, that's a fine line from shutting down the right of people to have thoughts or to communicate in ways that I don't even particularly like. Yeah. Yeah. So I have about a minute left. Um, going forward, do you, do you foresee that maybe we're moving in the right direction when it comes to this topic? I do. I, I think the fact of Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter is definitely a step in the right direction. I, he, he has a commitment to free speech. And again, as a psychologist, I think the more that we can learn to put labels on our feelings and share and exchange information, we're headed in the right direction. What's your recommendation for folks who maybe are having the conversation they don't like what the other person is saying? 
There's a technique from psychology called reflective listening. So what you do is you hear what the person says, and then you simply reflect it back. You say, okay, so if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that you feel X, Y, and Z, and you just really show that even if you don't agree, you've heard them and you're paying attention. And then you can say, no, I see it differently. Would you like to hear my perspective? And then what we're doing is we're having a dialogue instead of talking past each other. Right, right. Listen, as somebody who grew up in a in a pretty loud New York household, I, I appreciate where you're coming from on that with that one. So and very open minded. So, uh, Dr. Carmichael, thank you so much for taking some time and coming on with us. Thanks so much, Phil. Take care. Take care.